Thanks so much. Um, so, um, first of all, thank you for the thank you for the invitation. Right, I'm looking forward to discuss um, a bit of the, the the general work that I do. Right, which is my reflections on sort of open science and stuff, but more so right on these two recent projects that we're trying to sort of push out. Right, and I'm looking forward to hearing some thoughts uh, and ideas about it. Right, so. I've structured this talk into sort of three sections, right? One is uh, just a very short introduction about who I am, right? And some sort of very basic background. Um, the second part is uh, a bit of a discussion um, on sort of what I think changed in, in sort of in our fields, right? And what I'm doing specifically for um, sort of promoting, right? Open science, um, but also just in terms of like scientific practice, right? What I'm what I'm doing, right? And also hoping that it rubs off on on, on people, right? But it also that that sort of um, you know pushes some discussion. And then the main section, these two sections will, will be much shorter, right? And then the main section will obviously be some of the. I'll present two projects, right? Two papers that we hope uh, that are still not published, right? We hope to make preprints out of them relatively soon that are in this area of collective judgment work that I'm, um, that I've got to in, into recently, right? And that I'm sort of really proud of, right? And really looking forward to um, hearing people, um, well, hear what people think about it, right? So first off, bam, huge image of me, right? If you click on, if you click on my website, this is what you get, right? But very, very briefly, uh, my name is Amir. I'm an assistant professor um, in uh, Maastricht. Uh, so I'm coming to you from the, you know, so one of the southernmost cities in in uh, the Netherlands. <laughs> um, and I'm an assistant professor at the School of Business and Economics um, at the Department of Marketing and Supply Chain Management, um, and which is a very sort of interdisciplinary department, right? Um, Myself, I'm a trained psychologist. I did social psychology or social cognition, right, or social and cognitive psychology for my PhD, right? But I mostly do research in um, judgment and decision making, right? But also recently, right, some in, in marketing and consumer behavior, right? That's sort of the intersection that I find myself in. So I did a lot of work. Uh, this is one of the papers that I uh, uh, sort of that came out of my PhD, right? I'm not going to talk about it. It's just sort of to give you a bit of sense that I was uh, for a long time very interested in affective decisions, right? So decisions, um, how emotions and affect impact decisions, risk perceptions, and so on. So we did a lot of work like this, right, where we looked at how combinations of these affective experiences can impact you know, different types of judgments, valuation judgments, risky judgments, right, um, and so on. But what I'd like to talk to you more about is sort of how I came to, first of all, stay in academia, right, um, and also how I think I became a sort of advocate for a particular type of approach in in doing our science, right, in, in being a psychologist in, in 2023. So one of the things that um, I was sort of lucky or unlucky about, you could say, is that I started my PhD in, in 2014. And right about that time, um, everybody sort of got uh, just slightly worried. <laughs> uh, and it was right about that time in 2015 that I think the Open Science Collaboration was published, where we sort of saw, saw that if we try to replicate a bunch of stuff where that we took for granted, or me as a PhD student, when I was reading papers, right, I just sort of thought, well, this is published. So therefore, it equals that it's rigorous, equals that it's true, right? And then some people came along and said, um, well, guys, it turns out that that we can't actually get these effects. And even if we can, they're much smaller and they're much less reliable than, than we thought. So then what happened is that this coincided with a lot of worries, I think, uh, and, and sort of trials and tribulations on my part, which is that I was also seeing both myself and my colleagues not performing, I think, as the image of, uh, of of the people that we were reading was supposed to be, right? So people were publishing uh, a lot, right? Um, papers were always clean and nothing, nothing ever sort of happened that was there. And I was, I think, in a field where it is very difficult to do these things, right? So I was, I was doing research where we would try to manipulate emotions in the lab, right? So induce emotions and try to get to see how people's uh, judgments and decisions change. And uh, yeah, it didn't work all the time. It was very messy and, and we tried to follow a bunch of these things, right? So, so there was this convergence for me of, of, of people talking about issues in our science and also me seeing 
both myself and others having issues to replicate work, right? Sort of losing a lot of time and trying to build on, I think this is a very common story, right? But I think it's also worth telling maybe for new uh, people that are getting into this, right? Um, but this was sort of the confluence of things that happened for me, right? And then basically what happened is that I also felt that a certain vibe has shifted, right? Um, it was also at that time where I started to get in, uh, a bit more into Twitter, um, started following some people um, that were talking um, a lot about issues, replications, uh, rigor, um, QRPs, right? So questionable research practices, harking, all these things that are very sort of known right now. But at the time, it felt like this was sort of a genuine paradigm shift that was happening, right? And also what happened for me is that I was, I think, lucky in that sense is that I was at the right moment at the right time, which was that I was in a, I was, I did my PhD in France. So I was in a relatively good university in terms of allowing me to have funds to, you know, um, go to conferences, talk to people, go to workshops, right? And in particular, one is that I remember in, in Mannheim, which is a, a city in Germany in 2015, where a bunch of us sort of ECRs, I would say like early, you know, PhDs or, or something like that, we met and we were there. It was a lovely workshop, lovely conference where we were put in a hotel for seven days, something like that. And we just did judgment and decision-making research. It was uh, exceptionally like lucky to, to be able to do that. And I also met a lot of the people that I'm still in touch with there. But while I was there, I saw that people were talking about replication, doing things in R, right? Like being critical about papers. And that also helped me sort of um, come into this, I think, uh, 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 position where I was also feeling comfortable to do that, right? And, and also go back to my university and, and talk about these things. But I think ultimately what, what changed my perspective here is that I was, uh, I was seeing all of these issues around me and I said, well, I'm going to be doing this for the next three or four years, right? For my PhD, hopefully maybe also get a job in this. So what I was thinking is what can my contribution actually be and what can my contribution should be, right? When I'm sort of devoting my life to these things. And then I saw that a lot of people were talking about, you know, how open science can lead to more rigorous science, right? In terms of methodology and, and sort of statistical approaches. And this is what I tried to do, right? Um, I sort of uh, saw that there was a change and I changed a few things. So here's a few things that I particularly changed in my sort of work flow, which I think I'm sort of proselytizing almost every day to others, right? To my PhD students, to my students. But one of the things is obviously pre-registration. Um, it was a thing that um, really sort of opened my eyes to how easy it is to hypothesize after the fact, uh, to, to p-hack. I'm sort of, I'm not saying that I didn't do these things. Actually, I, I published a paper for my master thesis where I know that we followed a lot of these uh, um, sort of procedures that were common at that time, right? And now that I look back on it, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that was definitely a bit of, you know, hypothesizing after the fact, looking a bit at the data, right? It was a small paper, it was nothing important, right? But still, it was sort of very eye-opening, right, to do that. So what I try to advise to for everybody and what I try to do and what I apply, if you go to my website, if you go to look at the papers, is whenever possible, pre-register your stuff, right? I also think that it's not only possible, even in, in research when you might want to explore, which I think is good, there's still ways in which you can sort of um, try to bridge the thing. So this is an example on the left side here where we have um, a project about forecasting, for instance, where we didn't pre-register like, oh, we're going to look at these specific hypotheses, et cetera, et cetera. But what we did pre-register actually was which questions we're going to ask, how are we going to judge what is a true forecast, what is a fake forecast, right? What what you know, what is an incorrect one, what is a correct one? So there's a lot of ways in which you can, which pre-registration can help you think about your project, right, and your idea well in advance, right? And as soon as I started doing that, there's several things that I noticed. One thing that I noticed is that science is very difficult once you when you sort of try to think about things more sort of in a in a you know step by step type of way. And the second thing is is obvious, which is that once you see the data, your worldview sort of changes, right? You you're sort of you you have this benefit of hindsight. Uh, and then you start thinking, oh, I should have done this, but well, if I do it right, then it should be fine, right? I'm gonna find these things. Now, um, I always have to say that pre-registration is not a panacea, right? It's not a cure that will help us solve a bunch of things, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a really good way to help us be honest, right? And remain honest. 
The other thing that I implemented um, for some of these dogs is is what I call sort of the, the double control uh, approach, where we try, as, as if I'm working with with you know other people, is to always have as as many checks as possible for code, for materials, for things like that, because I'm always thinking in in terms of um, I'm going to share this. I want to share as much as possible by keeping it open. That also means that other people will see it, right? So there's two things that can happen. One, they can find errors. So we want to reduce our chances of, of, you know, having errors in there. And the second thing is then you want to make it readable, right? And understandable for people, right? So what we try to do is have code that is, you know, um, commented uh, profusely, right? It also helps us, right? In, in multiple ways or, or myself, um, but also keeping things open in, in terms of, um, I really embraced the, the sort of the concept of supplementary materials. I know Gilad does as well, right? We have in, in, in the paper that we have is just to report, you know, if I, if I did a study and it didn't work, I always try to report it, right? Um, it, either it goes in a supplement, right? If preferably it would go in the manuscript, but oftentimes we have some pushback from, from reviewers, right? Or from editors. Uh, but I think it's always good to sort of be as maximally open, right? But then to have somebody else work as your sort of opponent, right? To try to check you in some of these things. The third thing that I did relates to my students, right? And how I work with my students, right? Um, this is also, I think, something that I... Um, sort of um, picked up from uh, from Gilad and from other people is that we, as an assistant professor, you get to have a lot of master students, right? So um, that means that they work either on their own topics or on, on things that you want to work on. So what I try to do is also try to ingrain them, right, or indoctrinate them into this type of uh, more open and more rigorous way of doing work, right? So for instance, I have these documents, like right, an example of, of this one here that are open, where I try to give some tips and tricks, right, for thesis students when they come to the thesis process, right? Uh, and this type of uh, thing has a bunch of information in there, right? Both from tips about writing, but also how to share, um, you know, materials, data. And for a lot of students, this doesn't come naturally, right? I have to say to them, like, what I want to see at the end of the master thesis is, right, is that you have your code there. It doesn't have to be perfect, right? We're not going to be sharing this for, you know, the, the world to see. Um, but it is, I think, something that they come to appreciate later on, right? Um, another thing that I like to use for my students is, is open the open science framework, but more as a, a place for them to use as a version control, right? So what students often have is a lot of drafts and, and a lot of materials that they would like to share with me, but then we keep it in one place, right? And we don't have to share drafts. We can have, they can just upload their new versions, right? And it sort of overwrites it and we have all the versions there so they can go back to it. And it also helps them, I think, think about the projects in a more um, global right way. So I tell them, well, if you have a, a, a Qualtrics file, a QSF file, put it there, right? And they're also then starting to be a bit more careful about how they're doing things, how they're uh, approaching some stuff, right? And it, I have to be honest, right? It, it also helped us um, figure out a few areas where people were trying to sort of be a bit, like skip a few steps, right? So like going directly to maybe... Um, you know, uh, reporting more more information than that was there, right? So there's a lot of stuff that we have to be careful with here, right? And then it helps us, uh, or it helps me, right? When we have these, you know, OSF pages, and then each of my students has a has a sort of component there, and they can share stuff, right? I think it's good for them. The final thing, obviously, is uh, I mean, not the final thing, but one of the things that I would like to discuss here is is that I try to be involved with with replications, right? And I try to get involved as much as I can with uh, with you know replicating work, right? Um, and one example of this is, and and Gila sort of asked me to mention this, but I but I would mention it anyway, is the the paper that we did together, right? Um, so this is a project that was led and spearheaded by by Gila and and his students, right? Uh, where they try to replicate this uh, uh, this finding here, and then I sort of came along uh, to to sort of help with the writing, right, and help with the pushing out of the with the, with sort of the, the journal process, right. But I'm sort of very proud of this, right, for, for for many reasons. One of the reasons is that I actually have a personal connection to to this uh, uh, to this work, right, which is this is the work that sort of led me into academia, and I and the work that I also try to do some stuff in my in my PhD thesis, right. But um, and I think it's a good example of how 
replication work can be published uh, in a relatively good journal, right? But also have have certain have certain value that is beyond there, right? So this is just a very brief overview, right? This is a a, a, a replication of a very well famous is a relative term, right? <laughs> Depends on which area of the, of the field that you're in, right? For me, it was a famous paper where um, people found something really interesting, right? Which is that um, they saw in the early work on, on, on risk and judgment, right, in the 70s by all these uh, relatively now famous people like Kahneman, Paul Slovak, uh, Fischhoff, right, uh, um, Liechtenstein, all these people, they found that in people's heads, risks and benefits are negatively correlated, right? So people think that when something is risky, right, or when something is very beneficial, they think it's low in risk, right? When something is low in risk, they think it's high in benefit, right? So there's this weird thing, right? Um, and it's weird because, well, first of all, this is now how risk and benefits should work. They're distinct concepts. And oftentimes they're positively correlated, right? You would think normally that the riskier something is, the more benefit it should give you, right? Like, you know, it's a, it's a risky gamble, but you can get more money, right? Um, and then in this paper, what they try to do is to say, well, we think we have an explanation for this, for why there's this negative relationship. And they said, well, it's because of affect. When you say to people, um, the risk is high, they have a negative reaction to that, right? They sort of have a, a negative affective reaction to that, which in turn leads them to think, oh, this means that the benefits are low, right? Now, this was a paper that was out there. A lot of people have cited it, right, et cetera, et cetera. But what is interesting with a lot of these things, right, and also it, it sort of brings me back to 2015 and 2014 when I started my PhD, is that everybody sort of just takes these things for like, well, it's there, um, let's move along, right? Some people are publishing on it, right? But we know because of publication bias and all these things that, you know, could be uh, various reasons for why they, they're showing this. So then it's, I think, always good to try to replicate these things, right? Uh, but the problem is, uh, and and I think Eli can sort of uh, agree with me on this because he has more experiences that replications are often held to sort of a higher burden of proof, right? So if you do want to get into this, right, you should be prepared to really argue for why you're doing this, right, and why it's valuable for uh, for you to push this out there for others to see it, right? For us, we I think the 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 this is an actually a really clean example of this because the studies are relatively simple. We just, you know, the Lila students repeated them, right, and in a relatively straightforward way, right? But we still had to go through a lot of lengths to sort of um, uh, to show what the value of this work is, right? Um, and, and this often means one of these things that I have highlighted here, right? You either have to show that there's so what we did, we, we said, okay, well, actually, we want to replicate this because there's few causal demonstrations of the risk-benefit relationship, right? So that was one of the things that we had to really argue for, right? You couldn't just say, like, okay, which I think you should be able to say, okay, there's there's this paper, it's it's uh, relatively influential, uh, but we couldn't find any direct replication, so we did it here, right? <laughs> but you always have to go the extra step, right? So we also have to argue for, uh, okay, are there limitations in the original work? Can we improve on that, right? So we said, well, there are, right? There's They use a very non-standard way of analysis and approaching these things, right? We have to argue for the external relevance, like why is this, you know, is there is there some sort of will will the public be care or care about these things, right? And we also have to argue that there's no direct replication, right? But usually also if you want to get into this type of uh, type of work, right? Um, you also have to provide some extensions. Uh, that's something that I sort of see regularly, right? And I think uh, uh, maybe it's it, maybe it's changing, but I don't know. Is that if you do replicate something, you need to demonstrate also something novel to it, right? Which is a bit of a, a paradox, I think, right? Where they say, okay, uh, you know, I, I, we want you to directly replicate this as much as possible, right? We don't want you to deviate from this because then it's, you know, then we have to critique you for for deviating it. But we also want you to add something uh, new that's going to bring readers, right, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So replications exist on this sort of knife edge, I think, right, where they are, <laughs> where they have to balance uh, a lot of these things to be successful uh, in um, in publication, right? But ultimately, um, what I think all of these things have helped me to do is is sort of um, also notice that that dangers abound, right? Uh, while there's a lot of improvement, I think, and this is sort of a, a sort of a general feel about these things, 
um, in psychology, um, I think more generally, right, in, in some of the more prestigious journals like Psych Science, Perspectives, right, et cetera, in areas that are adjacent to it, right, and in areas that I'm also working with in, in like marketing and consumer behavior, there's still a lot of work to be done, right, in the area of open science and, and, and progress in terms of some of these things. So what I did was I just tried to look at some uh, uh, papers uh, in preparation for this talk, and I could easily find examples of, of things that we now know are relatively indicative of, of certain, you know, questionable research practices, like this example here, of people arguing that there is a difference, right, with p-values of 0.7 and 0.9, right? So this is a very common thing, right? Or simple, you know, whether it's typos or something like that, right? In the in the second example here, you see, whoops, uh, you see chi-square values, right? We know that the, the lowest chi-square chi value with, uh, you know, one degrees of freedom for it to be a 0 0.05, it needs to be 3.84, right? So it, it so this is this is something that uh, 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 sort of a software like StatCheck, right, or something like that would be able to pick up and say, well, this doesn't this doesn't feel right, right. So there's still a lot of work to be to be done in these areas, right. Um, there is some progress, right. There's papers like these that show that in, for instance, areas um, of consumer research and and, and marketing. Um, and I'm also showing you this, right, because it, it's adjacent to what I do, right? It's just an example of, I think there's progress, but we have to keep talking about this because we're, we're not, we're not there yet, right? So there's, there's papers like these that show that there has been an, indeed an increase in like sample size, uh, and, and things like that, but it also led to, uh, you know, a huge reduction in effect size, right? A huge reduction in stability, right? So that means that a lot of the literature previously, right, that's been published, may not be as reliable or as valid as as we think, right? And there's a lot of pushback, right? You also have to be ready for that, right? And and, and to see it, uh, very influential people, right, in consumer behavior and marketing, uh, this, these are currently editors of one of the premier journals of this, are saying, well, actually, no, pre-registration is not, <laughs> it's not something that we want, right? It's not necessary or sufficient for, for good science, right? Um, and the arguments for this are just... Um, um, yeah, we don't need to get into it, right? But the arguments against pre-registration seem to be um, very illogical, right? Because it's it's not something, either they're misguided, right? And saying that like, oh, once you pre-register, that's it. Your life is stuck to that, right? That That's not the case, right? You can always explore. You just need to say that it's exploratory and it's not confirmatory, right? But you do need to sort of be ready for a lot of pushback, right, in some of these areas. And also we see that with some unofficial counts here, uh, there's this really nice website called openmkt.org uh, by a, a guy called um, Aaron Charlton. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that right, where he's just tabulating um, sort of uh, papers that try to replicate uh, marketing studies, right? And you sort of see by the color here that uh, we're not doing so well, right? Uh, uh, of the direct replications of the high power direct replications that that he could find in literature, only five out of forty four have been successful. That's that's really really low, right? Um, so there is a lot of I think um, uh, uh, push that needs to be done in, in some of these areas, right? N not also for for researchers to sort of accept this, right? But I do I do see it, it sort of being changed, but also for sort of people in power, right, to sort of accept some of these things, right? So overall, while there is some um, movement, I think a lot more in areas of, of, of psychology and, and, and judgment decision making, right? In other more adjacent areas that I'm sort of involved in as well, like marketing and consumer research, the movement is, is, is very, very slow, right? And very stalled, right? But ultimately for me, what, what this basically boils down to is that what I try to do, given what I see in the literature and given what I um, currently think and, and know are, are good research practices is that um, I try to do these these three things, right? Um, I was trying to think of ways in which I can make them sound like nice and punchy, but I but I sort of couldn't, right? Because it's very ad hoc. What I'm doing is one thing is is very simple, which is the, to ask better questions, right? Um, oftentimes, what this means for me is that I uh, that I try to think, you know, uh, okay, how can I minimize measurement error? What am I asking here, right? Why does it does it relate to the previous literature, right? Am I building on something, or am I just looking at something because it's an effect that I thought about, you know, while while walking outside, et cetera, et cetera? So I'm trying to to sort of ask these more uh, uh, basic and 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 I'd say fundamental question. Not always; it doesn't always work. You get invited to be on papers. You you try, but you know, but you try to push these things in many ways. 
And the other thing is I try to think about what I call the time test, right? So if I look back on some publications 10 years from now, right? I don't want them to be, they can obviously be, you know, shown to be, oh, well, we, we showed this, right? There's some, uh, there's some uh, mistakes, et cetera, but that I'm trying to think of them more in terms of like, if I look back on them, they are as rigorous as, as, you know, useful as I think they could be at that moment in time, right? When I was doing them, right? And also the value test, right? Which I think is just like, how much value do you want to sort of, you know, uh, contribute, right? And also in, in terms of what is it that you're doing, right? With your with your time, right? And with your uh, uh, resources and your privilege of doing this type of, type of job, right? So with that in mind, right? Uh, this is a very sort of short slash long preamble. I also want to start talking about... Um, some of the work, right, that I think exemplifies this, right, and some of the recent things that, that I've been doing, right? Okay. So I would like to talk to you in general about um, basically simple aggregation algorithms to extract wisdom from crowds, right? It's a very, uh, a very journally title, but I'm going to try to explain uh, uh, what we're trying to do here. So this has worked with a lot of people, um, um, a lot from the Netherlands and, and the USA, and I'm also going to tell you why it's worked with a lot of these people, because a lot of this actually depends, a lot of this work hinges on people sharing their data, right? And us using a lot of, of other people's open data uh, and, and us doing some, uh, I think, interesting things, right, uh, in general. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of the, the second author here, right? Uh, uh, Philippe on the Calcite, he's also uh, in the Netherlands here. He sort of uh, spearheaded this, right? Um, and there's a lot of people uh, in this where we try to uh, where we try to sort of make this into a project, right? So let me give you, and this sort of relates to these asking these questions. Uh, let me give you like a little preamble uh, of what we're trying to do here. When you have people basically uh, naturally vary in knowledge and ex expertise, right? So that means that when you ask a group of people uh, the same question, what can often happen is that you get completely different answers, right? Now, this is a very broad way of saying something that I think happens a lot in the real world. Um, for instance, if you ask multiple doctors uh, to give you a diagnosis, right? Oftentimes, what you can see is they'll each give you uh, different things, right? I, this has happened to me many times, right? Especially if you go to an ophthalmologist, right? To get your uh, prescription, you go to one doctor and they're like, oh, you're a minus three, right? And then another doctor says like, you don't need glasses, <laughs> right? So there's a lot of like uh, uh, variety, right? In these types of things. And there's also research on this that shows it, right? That diagnostic sort of consistency is very rare between doctors, right? When you do this. There's also research in, in witness uh, uh, identification, right? Uh, uh, so if you ask a bunch of witnesses, right, what you can often see is that they give you different answers, right? And it's a huge problem, right? Because people, people's knowledge di diverges, right, et cetera, et cetera. So basically what we try to do here is to say, well, what strategy should people use to select correct answers? It's very simple, right, um, in, in that approach. So, uh, of course, there's research on this, right? And there's a bunch of things that you can do, right? Uh, and I'm sure many of you have heard of the wisdom of the crowd, right? Et cetera, et cetera, right? So one of the algorithms, right? And I'm going to use this term because it's used in the literature, but an algorithm here is just rule that you can follow, right? So one of the selection algorithms that has been proposed is just this very basic plurality rule, right? So if you ask a bunch of people, what you can do is just select the most popular opinion. If you've ever watched, you know, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire or any type of that, right? There's this joker where they say like, hey, do you want to ask the audience? And they say, well, you know, 70% of the audience thinks the answer is A, right? And your algorithm there will simply say, well, the majority thinks that it's A, so I should select A, right? This has been shown to be very effective, right? Uh, because it leads to error reduction. The more independent people that you ask, right? the more likely it is that you will reduce your errors and come to and converge to a true answer, right? There's books about this. There's a lot of research on this. However, this can often be problematic and biased, right? Groups can sometimes be biased towards an inaccurate answer, right? This is often called the tyranny of the majority, right? Um, there's these wicked uh, uh, questions that sometimes lead people to sort of converge on the wrong answer, right? Um, an example of this would be something like, 
uh, what's the capital of Australia? Most people tend to think it's Sydney, right? Where it's whereas it's Canberra, right? So there's examples of these things. Uh, it's especially difficult to apply this rule when the answers are open ended, right? When the answers are closed ended, right? Like these multiple choice questions or things like that, you can easily say like, well, seventy percent of the people chose A, right? That's easy. But when each doctor gives you a different diagnosis, right? It's very difficult to say, uh, oh, okay, let me aggregate this, right? Because sometimes they can also use different terms for the same thing, right? They can think you could have hypertension, right? But one calls it this, one calls it that, right? So there's a lot of issues with it. Another selection algorithm that you can use is um, you basically sort of wait on the cues that you think correlate with accuracy, right? What you can do, and this picture behind you sort of gives you an idea, I don't know if you know where's Waldo, right? So you have a bunch of people there, right? And you try to find Waldo, right? And the idea here is very similar, is that you would somehow find the person who you think is most knowledgeable in this group and say, well, actually, I'm going to just go with this, this person's answer, right? Just select this person. There's also other ways in which this, this has been shown to work, right? Uh, for instance, there's this uh, really nice paper by Korea who shows that if you select people who say they're most confident, right, more often than not, you will end up with the correct answer, right? So just going, you know, from person to person asking them, how confident are you? And you're saying, like, oh, this person is the most confident. I'm going to select your answer and, you know, be right, hopefully. But these also have certain problems, right? To get at who is the most knowledgeable person, you need to have historical data, which usually means you need to have data on how well they performed previously or other types of information, education, intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. Or if you want to, you know, wait on these cues like confidence, et cetera, you need to ask people additional questions, right? So we thought, well, there's an easier way to do this. Why don't we use response time as a cue, right? As a selection algorithm, right? So uh, what we're thinking is that response time is something that everybody can easily observe. How quickly or how slowly has somebody provided you with a response, right? It's straightforward to collect because you can just easily sort of either perceive this, right? But also it's convenient, right? Observable. But also you can sort of, you know, if you ask them in a, in a Qualtrics survey or whatever like that, you can easily collect response times, right? Et cetera. So let me just give you a very brief definition of what response time is because everybody, I think, knows this. But the response time is basically uh, operationalized in two ways. One is from the start of a stimulus, right, to the start of your response, right? So you could, for instance, see an image, right, until when you press something, right? And also from the start of a stimulus till, we, till you end your response, right? That's sort of the, the very basic uh, operationalization of response time. Now you might be thinking, okay, that's all fine and dandy, right? But what does response time have to do with, with you know, accuracy and me being able to identify uh, an accurate answer in a crowd? And there has been research, of course, shown that response times correlate with accuracy, right? So uh, there's been um, research in eyewitness testimony that shows that faster witnesses tend to make fewer mistakes and are more accurate, right? But also medical diagnoses, right? where uh, faster doctors tend to be providing more accurate diagnosis. So what we're trying to do here is basically leverage this correlation between response time and accuracy on a collective level, right? And we try to say, well, we have a suggestion for an algorithm, which is what I think everybody should do is select the answer of the person that is fastest to respond to a particular question, right? Now, what I should also say is this, this, this is an adaptive algorithm, right? So if you ask, let's say, you know, 30 people multiple questions, from question to question, the algorithm can pick different people, right? So uh, Gila could be fastest in providing the answer on question one, right? But I could be fastest in providing the answer to question two. So it's an adaptive algorithm, right? It doesn't mean that, you know, if Gilad is the most knowledgeable person in, in here, right, then this algorithm wouldn't be uh, uh, adaptive. It would say, this is the most knowledgeable person, select him for, or her, right, for each of the answers that they're providing, right? And I'm going to show you, hopefully, how this works. Um, and one of the things that we did, right, we thought, well, where could we sort of easily test it in a, in a very uh, uh, natural way? And a lot of us, I think, maybe in academia or something like that, we're, we're attracted to these like quizzes and sort of general knowledge tests and things like that. 
And there's this um, TV show in the Netherlands called uh, Met the Mess of Tafel. And it's uh, uh, translated, it's like, you know, with the knife on, on the table. So it's like something like, you know, like take your chance or something like that. Uh, that, that's, that would be the translation. But the, the very brief description of this is that it's a TV show that's been long running in the Netherlands. And you have access, if you live here, you can rewatch these uh, episodes, right, on, um, on the, the sort of national broadcaster's website, right? So they're sort of free for everybody to, to watch. This means that this data is openly available, right? So what we did is we uh, watched a bunch of these shows and coded for um, a bunch of things. This is something that's been used before. It's not a method that that's been sort of uh, developed by us, right? But people have looked at if you look if you're interested in decision making, you can look at behavior of people in quizzes like you know the Price is Right. Uh, one of two of our co-authors also did a lot of research on this, uh, Denis von Dolder and Martijn. Um, awesome. So they're also, uh, they also did a lot of work on, on this, right? But the setup here is very simple. There's a host, there's three contestants, and the host asks the question. And what we as viewers can see is when people start, when they answer, they have to write down their answer on a, on a screen, right? So you see these tiny screens in front of them, they have these electric pens, right? If you ever watch Jeopardy, you, you can sort of know how that is, right? So that means that what we as observers can can sort of code for, right, and, and, and see is who is first to start answering, who is second to start answering, who is third, right? But also who is last, right? So there's a bunch of these things that we can look at. So what we did is watch 270 episodes of this, right? We collected information from 810 contestants, right? Which effectively ended up with, we effectively ended up with uh, answers on 7,803 questions, right? So you have to think of it like this, right? There's there's some details I'm not gonna go to in, in, in the quiz, right? Sometimes people come back to the quiz, right? If it's a finals and things like that. So it's not always different people, right? Um, but they are always answering different questions, right? Uh, so to speak. And we could find data or we could find uh, quizzes shows basically from September 2012 to November 2021, right? This is what was available uh, on the website. And what you have to sort of know here is that these are open-ended knowledge questions that are asked, right? So I could ask the same question, but these participants could answer in very different ways, right? So it's very similar to what I've been discussing so far, right? You ask different people, they can give you different answers, right? There's seven rounds of play. Uh, each round has a bunch of questions in it. And after the first four rounds, what you have to know is that uh, it has three contestants, but after the first four rounds, one of the weakest contestants, so the one that sort of scored the worst, is eliminated. So you only, you only get two contestants. And we also incorporate this into our analysis, which you'll see later on, right? So what we coded, this is an example of what you can see, right? So you can see three contestants, right? And you can see what they're writing, right? So what we coded when we watched this was, um, well, three things. First, who's fastest or slowest, right, to start writing their response. So literally, if the question was, what's the capital of the Netherlands, right, we would say whoever started writing Amsterdam first, right, we would give them a, a rank, right. So you have to sort of also notice here that we're, in terms of response time, we're talking about ranks here, who was first, second, or third, right. We also coded for um, who was fastest or slowest to finish writing, right. So these are end ranks, right. And we obviously coded who provided correct answers or not. We also coded for a bunch of things, but for you guys, this is what I think is important to know. So we only focus on usable questions. You might be thinking already, right? Well, you know, these algorithms, what if somebody just writes down, I don't know, right? Then the algorithm will sort of penalize them, right? Maybe it's really fast to write down, I don't know, and just move on to the next question. So what we did is we went through, we, we have a little a selection uh, mechanisms there that because of the positioning of the camera, there's also joke answers. Sometimes people just write down something because they don't know, right? Or they don't write down anything. We only include actual answers, right? Which means that out of these 7,800, we can end up with some 6,628 usable questions, right? What you should also note that is that start ranks are less noisy, right? Uh, and we base our results that I'm going to present you here based on those, right? We also in the supplement look at end ranks, right, uh, uh, as response time, but these are more noisy, right? And for a very simple reason, right? Sometimes people don't write in the same speed, right? Or also sometimes um, 
people can differ in how much they write, right? If they say uh, the capital, what's the capital of the Netherlands is the question, it takes longer to write down Amsterdam, right, than it is to take, uh, is, than it is to take, to write down Urk, right, which is another city in the Netherlands, right, or the Hague, or whatever, right? So the result that I'm going to show you here is based on start ranks. The results are the same for N, N ranks, but they're just a bit less expressed, right, because of this noise, right? And we also coded for type of question. So there's around 6,044 general knowledge questions, 206 grammar questions, et cetera, et cetera. You also need to know that when there's a tie, right, this can happen. People can start writing at the same time. Uh, we don't randomly pick the answer, right, to avoid any sort of computational errors there. We just average the answer together, right? Um, but in the supplement, we also do a lot of different things to sort of uh, show that this works either way, right? So we tested four selection algorithms, which we think are, um, you know, strategies that people can use in their real life. So one is the, the FTF algorithm, which is to say, per question, select the answer of the person who is responding fastest, or F, follow the slow, person who is answering slowest. And we also have an algorithm called follow the best, right? Now, this is a very conservative algorithm, right, where we say, follow the answer of the person who scored best on all other questions. This is, by the way, something that we can only do computationally, right? If you're an actual participant in, in, in this quiz, right, or if you're actually looking at this, you can't do this because you don't have information on what's happening forward, right? So this is what we have here. But we want to use this because we want to see whether our algorithm beats out this highly conservative selection mechanism, right? And we also have a, a, a benchmark, which we think that uh, people often use, is that when they don't know whose opinion to follow, they just pick randomly, right? So what we do here is, well, select the random person. Okay, this is a lot of results, so let me take you step by step through some of them, right? So let's focus on the left hand side here. So we just look at very basic percentages, right? What's the percentage of questions that you can answer correctly? In these graphs, they're not, you know, they're not, they're nothing fancy, right? Because uh, we don't think it's necessary to have anything fancy here, right? In these graphs, you also see these. Um, let me. You also see these two lines right here. Each graph has them. And let me quickly explain what these lines are for. So above this upper line, right, are questions that everybody gets incorrect, right? So you, you this is just to give you sort of a sense of where the algorithms and how their performance lies. Above this, people aren't doing well. Almost every question is answered correctly, incorrectly, sorry, right? Below this line, though, right, these are sort of the, you could call them, you know, questions where, um, Below is the percentage of questions where they all sort of provide correct answers, right? Um, so the interesting area for us is essentially this one here, right? Because this is where you can sort of get your edge, right? If you follow a certain algorithm or not, right? Because these aren't interesting because they're all incorrect, right? And these are, these are interesting because they're all incorrect. And these ones are interesting because they're all correct, right? So whatever, no matter what you pick, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. So this is the area in each of these graphs, right? Uh, where you're interested in and what you're going to, which type of algorithm is going to perform. So on the left hand side, you see the follow the fast algorithm, then the follow the best, random and slow. In this part here, you see the success rate across all 6,000 questions. You see that if you follow the fast person, you're going to be right, you're going to get 67.7 questions correct. We think this is quite amazing, right? Especially because the follow the best algorithm only performs around 57%, right? If you follow the random person, obviously you're around 55%, right? Which makes sense, right? But following the slowest person will, that's the worst strategy you can sort of apply here, right? Now these are across all questions, right? We had a bunch of things that are innately related to the quiz, right? Uh, so we have to take care of them there. Uh, this is success rate across questions that only have three contestants, right? So this is, these are only the first four rounds, and you see the results are similar, right? These are only involving the two contestants that are, uh, you know, after one is eliminated, right? You have the two contestants. But there's a bit of a selection bias here, right? Because obviously the worst person is, is sort of selected out, right? So you could be thinking, oh, okay, these two are directly comparable, right? So what we also do is from the three-person crowd, we randomly create two-person crowds, right? to make it more comparable, right? So now you see that indeed, the fast algorithm performs a bit better, right? When there's more people to choose from, right? When the group size is larger, 
right? Which makes sense, right? Because there's more chances that the algorithm will pick up on the most accurate answer. We also split up the results across question type. So in this area here, you see the results of these. Again, it's left is follow the fast, follow the best, random, and follow the slow. We see the results for general knowledge questions, right? The results are pretty similar. Follow the fast does well. For grammar questions, it's a similar story, right? And also for word riddle questions. The differences aren't that large here, right? So there's obviously some effect of question type. But the question type effect is strongest, I think, when we look at math questions. There, we see the algorithm do not perform that well, right? It's not materially different than follow the best, right? And it's also very close to the random selection, right? And also drops a lot, right? There's various reasons for this, right, that we speculate on. First, it could be that these questions are just inherently more difficult, obviously, right? But it could be also that while there wasn't no response time pressure from the participants, right, you could argue that, well, if they were given sort of, there is sort of a natural flow to the show, right? If they were given more time, perhaps they would have sort of gotten to the answer. These, these are types of questions that also maybe require more thinking, right? So there's also interesting discussions there. Study two is, again, based on open data, right? Uh, which is medical data that we got from these authors here called Shabino et al., right, in 2012. What they have is a data set of 47 real doctors, physicians, diagnosing 25 medical cases, right? And what they had was each of these doctors was shown uh, sort of various general, um, like, a, like a text, right, of a patient, and uh, they diagnosed various general and, and acute medical problems, right? So they get like a patient history, one diagnostic result, and the result of a physical examination, right? So it's a free test text diagnosis. That means that they have to write down again or type, sorry, their uh, responses, right? The important thing here, though, is that response times are sort of measured in seconds. They're not ranks, right? We now literally have like how much time each person took to diagnose and click next, right? So these are based on finish times, right? The response time. And accuracy of the diagnosis was not reviewed by us. It was reviewed by four experts in the field who said, like, you get zero if you're incorrect, one if you're partially correct, and two correct. What we do here is slightly different, right? So the algorithms are, 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 are the same, but we now have the option to create different crowd sizes, right? Because we have 47 doctors, what we can do is out of these 47, we can randomly create crowd sizes of three, five, 10, right? To get each time get a compositionally different crowd, right? To each time get different doctors in a crowd. So what we do this is we create 20,000 different crowds, right? For each crowd size, we apply the algorithms, we save the results. It's just a way to sort of see how robust, right? Our approaches are. And lo and behold, we get very similar results, right? So on the left side here, you see the results aren't, there's not much difference, right, between the follow the fast and follow the best when there's only two physicians per group, right? However, when there's five phys physicians, 10 physicians, 15 physicians, you see the follow the fast still works better, right, than the follow the best. Mind you, the follow the best is a very conservative algorithm. It's not something that you can use in real life, right, because it's sort of, it's based on all answers, right? So randomly picking, you get about 50, you know, 51% accuracy, right? Which is sort of true across all of them. Uh, going for the slowest, right? You might think, oh, you know, maybe I should go for the doctor who's uh, taking their time to diagnose is actually performing worse than random, right? So uh, it's, 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 it's there. And then the follow the fast is sort of the, was the best strategy. What we can do here in these in this data set is that we can also split these questions in, in terms of difficulty. So what we can say is, what's the percentage of people right that got a particular medical diagnosis correct, right? And what's the so we could say if if a large percentage of people got it correct, that could be qualified perhaps as a as an easier question, right, versus as a more difficult question. So if we just look at these easier questions, right, where most of the doctors get the um, uh, diagnosis correct. We again see, right, for 2, 5, uh, 10, and 15, that follow the fast is still the, the best strategy, right? However, for more difficult questions, obviously, right, for more difficult diagnoses, the fast does perform better, right? But you see a, a huge decrease in all algorithms, right? Even the follow the best is performing quite low, right? Uh, the, the, the random selection is, is much worse, right? And the slow is, is, is the worst, right? So there's obviously a huge effect on how 
difficult or easy these questions are, right? Mind you, this is not a traditional way of categorizing ease or difficulty, right? Because this is based on an in-sample approach of categorizing difficulty, right? So we say, what's the percentage of these doctors that got it correct? And very briefly, you also have a third study, right? So you could say, well, this could these could all be flukes, right? So we have another medical data set from these colleagues here, right, which are also on the paper. This also explains why there's a lot of people on the paper, uh, where they have 117 physicians, right, diagnosing eight medical cases, very similar again, right, uh, based on uh, experts diagnose the accuracy. We do the we do a similar methodology, except this time they also measured confidence, right. So we can also compare our strategy to just selecting the most confident answer. And the story gets a bit more complicated, right? Now you have to see that the follow the most confident, which is the left side here, actually performs better, right? So it goes confident, fast, best, random, slow, and least confident, right? So you can see that still there's improvement across crowd sizes, right? But we cannot beat the following the most confident uh, um, a doctor, right? So there is a large sort of benefit to this uh, uh, to this uh, uh, methodology, right? To this uh, selection algorithm based on the response time, but it does not beat the confident uh, selection algorithm. However, what you should know is that with the confident one, you need to ask additional questions, right? With the fast, you don't, you just, you sort of don't need to do that, right? So you can just do it. And again, we have a split for easy questions, right? Which is in purple here. Uh, uh, we see similar findings, right? But for the difficult ones, uh, we see just a, a sort of decrease overall, right? But the pattern remains the same. We're following the most confident is still the best, but uh, and then followed by the fast, right? The best and, and, and red. So there's a few takeaways, right? We think that follow the fast is a very viable strategy for some of these things, right? We applied it on a, a, a sort of vast area of general knowledge questions and medical data, right? Uh, there's these two types of, of, of data sets and these two types of judgments are very different, right? You have to think of in medical, in general knowledge, right? There's always a, a correct answer, right? But medical data are, are very sort of uh, what I think are called sort of irreducible uncertainty judgments, right? Where there's very, you know, it's there are, there's obviously a, a cor correct answer, right? But there's degrees of, of freedom in which you can sort of uh, uh, vary there, right? The follow the fast algorithm improves with larger crowds, right? Because there's a higher chance of selecting the most uh, accurate individual, right? Because there's a larger pool. But it does underperform compared to confidence, right? But we still think that compared to that, it's still more straightforward and practical, right? Because you don't need to ask these additional questions and it's sort of observable, right? And um, there's obviously a lot of discussion that's, uh, that can be talked about this, right? One is obviously about the, the sort of the confluence between the situation and response time. We don't think that this algorithm will work well if there isn't a correlation between response time and accuracy, right, in the data set. By definition, it cannot work. So there must be some situations, right, where there simply can't, there simply isn't maybe a correlation between response time and accuracy, so you can't use this type of approach. It's sort of, I think, something that we need to look at in, in, in sort of in, in, in follow-up research, right? But there's also, we have to be careful, right, in saying that perhaps it's not always that following the fast should be the, the, the best approach, right? Perhaps there are situations and, and question types where following the slow would provide you with some, some benefit, right? This is what we have to sort of disentangle a bit more carefully, right, and, 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 and in future work. Uh, a paper, it's me and Philippe again. What we try to do is leverage some of these algorithms again to help us identify misinformation, right? We think this is quite important, right? So I don't need to tell you about this. Misinformation is a huge problem, right? Um, if you go online, um, more often than not, you can be, you can encounter either sort of some fake news, right? What it's usually called, right? Um, there's different estimates to, to the extent that, that there's some debate on this, right? Some, some papers argue that what they call a fake news diet of, a, of an average person isn't that large, right? But there's some people who argue that, in fact, it is, right? Uh, and there was a lot of research after 2016, right? But there was a lot of <laughs> weird things that happened, right? With the Brexit vote and and, and the U.S. Uh, elections, et cetera, et cetera. But there's papers that actually show, right, contrary to this, that a reach of, of a fake news item is is much, much wider than a reach of a sort of, of a correct news item, right? So there's, there's this um, confluence there, right? But we think it's a really big problem and a lot of people agree, right? And there's a lot of research in why people, uh, you know, why researchers think why people fall for fake news. One is that they seem to be politically motivated. The other is that, you know, other suggestion is that it's simply reasoning, 
some people don't have uh, a lot of cognitive ability, right, or higher reflection, so they fall for these things, right? Um, others think it's just that people tend to rely on heuristics, right? One of the important ones is familiarity, right? So the more familiar something um, seems, uh, uh, you know, you're more likely to say that it's true, right? Um, but then you're more likely to fall and say like, oh yeah, this is fake news, right? But you're more likely to say it's true. And there's also these illusory truth effects if you haven't heard about them, right? So the more something gets repeated, the more likely that you think it's true, right? It's a very pervasive phenomenon, right? And a lot of people have shown that it replicates quite well. Um, so what the issue here is that there's a bunch of interventions that people are trying to do, right? How do you get people to not fall for these things? How do you get them to identify these uh, fake news? One is automatic detection, which is just algorithms, real algorithms, uh, not the ones that I've been talking about, going, trawling through Twitter, trawling to, to X, sorry, X, Facebook, right? All these things. And they try to say like, oh, let, let's try to find what our sort of um, uh, what we think are fake news, we can down flag them or, you know, um, um, or do something else with them, like remove them. But there's also issues with this, right? Uh, algorithms often are very stationary. The data changes quite, you know, political situation changes, so they're not very good. The other option is just professional fact checkers. Uh, these are people who would effectively be hired to add labels, right, onto news um, information. But these are not scalable, it takes time and effort, right? Or you can do a bunch of other things like emphasize news publishers, right? Uh, Pre-bunking, inoculation, there's a bunch of them, right? One potential intervention that has been shown, that has been suggested is just crowdsourcing, right? So this is, the idea is that fact checking is unscalable. You know, you have to hire these fact checkers, they take a lot of time. Why not just simply ask a bunch of people, is this news item uh, fake or true, right? take their answer and and then use that to decide what to, whether to remove it, right, or to do something with it. Um, the problem there, of course, is that it's lay people judging truthfulness, right? So you might be thinking, um, well, if lay people are falling for fake news, how is it that then, you know, a bunch of lay people's answers can sort of get you to uh, be more accurate? But there's actually evidence that this is true, right? Um, there's a bunch of papers by uh, Gordon Pennycook, right, and, and David Brand. These are the people who do a lot of this work. Um, I think they're also uh, very passionate about this, as where they show that crowdsourced judgments, right, from lay people tend to correlate really well with fact checkers, right? And then they tend to perform really well for individual news items, right? And this is, again, because of all the stuff that I told you before, is that uh, you know, aggregation and error reduction um, just happens, right? And and you can get these more accurate answers. So they suggest that this is a really viable alternative. This is where we come in, right? Where we say, okay, crowds genuinely seem to be very effective, but we think the data is left on the floor, right? Um, so we say important judgment cues are not included, like confidence and familiarity, right? If we ask some of these other additional things, maybe we can improve on, on some of these things. This is especially true because of what I mentioned already, because of this tyranny of the majority, right? If there's going to be these items where even the majority is going to get it wrong, right? Because simply they they might be more familiar with it, right? They might be more popular, et cetera, et cetera, right? So can we find a way to improve on 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 these crowdsourced rules, right? So I'm going to briefly follow you, go, sort of guide you through these studies. I don't want to take too much of your time, right? The first study that we did was a study in, at my university. We have this uh, participant pool here. We asked 234 people to evaluate 10 news items, five fake, five true. Um, and importantly, right, we just asked them, is the claim made in this news headline article correct or not? These were true. These were actual headlines, right? What we tried to do is because we did this in Europe, we also tried to find some more European-based news, right? Not just uh, US-based ones, right? And for each item, we told, we asked people, hey, can you provide this, your confidence in this judgment and how familiar you are with this uh, item? We didn't look at response time, et cetera, et cetera, because our prediction is that a response time wouldn't be re a relevant sort of cue here, right? And we also uh, see that it isn't. Uh, because these judgments are very different, right? They're sort of based on a more, more general conception, right? We also ask people to provide their um, the results on the CRT. Hopefully you know what that is, right? So it's the cognitive reflection test. You know, these are questions like the bat and the ball cost, et cetera, et cetera. It's sort of a measure of analytic thinking. There's debate on it, right? But it's used quite a lot, right? So we have this information. So this is some examples of news items that, that we use, right? Uh, the two on the top are true. Um, you know, former Italy PM has been investigated over response, right? The lower ones aren't, uh, the left, the lower left one is particularly funny, which is, uh, shared by a reputable news source where they said like lecturers were asked to stop using capital letters to avoid upsetting students, right? 
this is obviously an, an incorrect, right, or, or a fake news item, right? And then this one here about uh, WHO, right, um, and, and authority given to the US pandemic. So we have these selection algorithms, right, that we're testing here. One is the simple plurality, plurality rule, right? So this is a very simple crowdsource rule. What does the majority say? We say, select the answer of the most confident person, select the answer of the most familiar person, right? Or select the answer of the person who we think scores highest in CRT, right? And we have our novel strategy that we think will beat out all of them, right? And I'm going to reveal it <laughs> now. So this is where we made our prediction, right? We thought, okay, there's this research that shows that if people are familiar with an item, they will be, they will be more likely to say that it's true, right? So this max familiarity strategy, right? So we saying like condition, right? Or select the person of the, uh, uh, select the answer of the person who you think is most familiar. These people will do really well on true items because by default they'll say these are true items, but they will do really bad on the fake items, right? Because the more likely they think they're familiar, the more likely that they'll say it's true, which is fake, right? Which is an incorrect answer. So we thought of a problem, right? And we thought of this is that, well, how do you then leverage this max familiarity, right, for true, but minimize its influence for fake? So we thought of this, a disagreement strategy, right? We predicted that if there's considerable disagreement between the majority, what the majority says, and the max familiarity rule, the item is likely to be false. Again, because the max familiarity people are going to be are going to be saying this is a true item, but the majority will be saying this is a fake item, right? So if there's large disagreement there, our algorithm simply says this is a fake item. If there's low disagreement, we say it's a true item, right? So we're trying to sort of build on this crowdsourcing strategy by simply asking an additional question, right, which is familiarity, and hoping that we could get improved identification results, right, that somebody can uh, find fake or true. So again, we have the simulation strategy where we, you know, create different group sizes, right, sizes of 5, 11, 31, out of these 234, right? We iterate this hundreds of times, right, to sort of get a more robust result to get at what is called the ground truth, right, what you saw before. And these are the results, right? Um, so I split the, the results here based on false and true items. And the y-axis is simply just uh, uh, we had fake items, right? So it's the average of how many you got correct, right? It's a very simple um, um, DV. So this is how the majority rule performs, right? With an increase of crowd size, you see that it performs well, right? For both fake or true, right? But they're still not getting to this sort of upper limit, right, of, of approaching the, the sort of five correct, right, in both of these. This is how the others are performing. If you look at the max familiarity rule, as predicted, this is the blue one, it does really well on the true items, right? With increased crowd sizes, it almost gets to like four and a half, right, accurate out of five. But it does really, really badly for fake news items, right? Because the more familiar they think, the more likely they think it's true, when in fact this is a fake item. Now our disagree strategy is in blue. So we said, well, if there's a large disagreement, it's fake between the majority and the max similarity. If it, there isn't, it's true. And we get these, I think, very relatively large improvements, right? Where we see that it does exceptionally well. It's almost with perfect accuracy can identify um, fake news items. And it also performs much better than all of these, right? For, uh, for true items, right? Especially for uh, low crowd sizes. Very briefly, we did a replication. We added some other uh, uh, items as well. Uh, we now have 14 items, seven true, seven false. We see similar results, right? Uh, the the max familiarity does well, uh, but you may be thinking it's all about the you know the items that you're using. So we then went to another uh, study that had open data about this, right? Where they asked 760 people, 32 headlines. Uh, in two batches, right? Um, I'm going to skip about some of these some of these details, right? But in the upper part here, you see the true items, right? There's 16 true items in batch one, 16 in, in batch two. This is just related to how they do their study. We see our algorithm in dark blue perform really, really well, right? But also for fake news items in particular, right? It outperforms the majority, the max confidence, the max familiarity rule. Very briefly, right? Uh, crowdsourcing is effective. We think we found an improved selection algorithm, right? That leverages sort of the this quirk of human psychology, right? That leverages familiarity, right? 
And but the problem is obviously there's a lot of stuff to talk about adaptability, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to be really brief for the takeaways. Um, do open science, right? There doesn't seem to be any excuses. Fields are grappling with it. They're converging towards this, right? Um, a lot of talk has been now about registered reports, right? Where you uh, submit just your methods, right? And then uh, a journal is sort of required to publish your results if the methods are done well, irrespective of the results. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of places where you can find them. Um, but I do think that there's still fears, right? That you should be wary about. I see this as a reviewer. We shouldn't let open science become sort of a signal-based uh, approach. I do see it a lot. If you are a reviewer and people and and people say we register it, read the pre-registration. It may not be good, right? So there's there's obviously some areas that we can improve upon things, right? Um, it doesn't mean that open science just simply equals good science, right? So please uh, uh, be aware of that. I I always try to talk about you know, improve the thinking practices, the statistical practices, the methodological practices, right? And then the openness should sort of follow along from that. And as for the collective intelligence work, right, um, I sort of encourage a lot of people to do uh, uh, as much as can on this because there's a lot of data out there. Here's just a few examples. Um, the Good Judgment Project is there's open data on thousands of participants making forecasts. Uh, this uh, project here, the Wisdom of Crowd Analysis Project, which I'm now also uh, part of, just tries to get as many people as, as, as can to sort of see which uh, types of aggregation systems are best, are right. You can still, I think, participate. You should also try to use crowdsourcing, I think, in scientific work. Uh, one of the projects that I was also involved in, um, but as a participant, right, is these multiple analyses projects, right? So this is an example of one here where you have multiple people try to analyze or replicate different, uh, uh, different analytic structures, right? There's also examples of collective intelligence being used for direct work, right? So this is an example uh, that I recently came across of where they got like, you know, 700 uh, uh, volunteers, so crowdsourced workers, right, to try to assess the reproducibility of uh, around 500 articles published in Management Science, which is a really sort of important and, and uh, sort of prestigious journal, right, um, there. That's pretty much it. Um, sorry for going a bit over time, right? Uh, but um, I'm so happy that you could uh, hear what, what we're discussing, right? And if there's any questions, please let me know. Wow, fascinating stuff. Uh, terrific. Lots of lot things of stuff, to <laughs> think about. Uh, I'll start from like the practical uh, implications. You you kind of finished with the thing about uh, reproducibility and. Kind of like joining the two things together. I, as much as I like doing replications, I'm a little bit tired. I just want to know what works. You know, I don't want to like uh, do again and again until for, for everything that's been published, the ratio is unsustainable. There's lots more novel studies than there are replications. We need to come to some algorithm <laughs> where we could just uh, know based on whatever uh, methodology, uh, what, what can we do? So there's lots of projects out there, DARPA score and a bunch of others that are trying to do all sorts of things. It seems like you've got some experience comparing different algorithms and now you're like adding one more or two more actually that are offering new directions. So uh, what, what do you think about uh, kind of like applying some of these things that you've been dealing with, uh, with the issue of what can we trust or what can we follow? What can we uh, build on in our science, in our findings? Yeah, I mean, wow, that's a very interesting and sort of broad question, right? Uh, something to think about. I think I think there is value in, in this. And, and, and I think this is sort of for, for multiple reasons. One of the reasons why I think there's values in, in sort of proposing these algorithms and in this way is because I think this is how the, the sort of our, our brain works when it comes to these things, right? So when we read a paper, at least that's how I do it. When I read a paper, I try to find a few things that will sort of immediately be an indication of whether something is trustworthy or not, right? And I know there's a lot of work on, uh, done on this, right? But there's a few things that, that I think everybody can sort of easily identify on, right? So one is sort of just the 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 you know either either following first like looking at what the stability of the p-values is, right? So this is also a, a, a rule that you can follow, right? What is the sample size, right? Um, is somebody making a sort of extraordinary claims, right? I saw recently there was a lot of discussion about some papers in in, in consumer research where that were published with effect sizes of coincidence of like 13 or something like that, right? So there's so we now know much, much more, right, the, about like 
what is the things that we can expect in terms of stability, right, of our effect sizes, right? And also what are some of the cues that we can use for more trustworthy uh, um, identification of, of, of research? There's, I don't know whether, uh, it's also giving me some ideas now whether we can <laughs> do some research about this, right? But I know there's also people have, who have suggested these things, right? So like, what's the sample size? You know, what, what is the stability of the p-value? If you just look at some of these things, if you look at it and, and sort of weigh it very quickly, I think you can come to a very accurate judgment right about some of them as to what the effectiveness is of of these other tools like darpa and stuff like that i think it's commendable that people are doing it right but i do know that the sheer size of of, of and the sheer speed in which the papers are published that just means that the the net is simply too narrow right to to go over this i know that there are some automated tools like stat check right that are helpful for for sort of these initial diagnoses, but yeah, I don't, I don't know to what extent they can, uh, uh, they are effective or not, because I think you don't know that much about them, to be honest. But in terms of having these sort of rule-based approaches to judge whether something is, is sort of trustworthy or not in our science, I think that's very much doable, right? And because we know that there's certain correlates with, uh, um, in, in methodological practices and trustworthiness that are there, right? That's at least my opinion, right? Um, yeah. So, so anything you think we can do like with the crowdsourcing methods in order to get like a higher accuracy in detecting what is replicable and what isn't? So aside from like all the, I don't know, p-values, effect size and all of this, like human-based yeah. judgments, anything we can do with crowdsourcing that would do this better? I don't know if fast would be like a good rule here or familiarity. I don't yeah, know. I mean, well, what's your yeah, thought? I guess, yeah, it's it's very much an empirical question, right? But there are people providing comments, you know, on, on, on Puppier and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe some of these things can more easily be leveraged, right, for a more broader audience. I'm thinking about something like, Community notes is a very interesting concept at, at Twitter and, and X, right? Where where people can just sort of add notes, right, to things that are shared, right? And then based on aggregation, you could easily say, well, most people seem to think, right, this is sort of going in a in a weird direction, right? Do you really want to share this, et cetera, et cetera? So there's maybe room where where this can easily be done, right? I don't know to what extent there are there's research. If there isn't, then then we should do it, right? Whether people are whether lay people are actually able to identify uh, uh, trustworthy articles based on, you know, uh, a few cues or not, right? This will be extremely interesting to do. My initial prediction is that they they actually would be, right? There's also a lot of this uh, uh, research that, that shows that uh, researchers <laughs> tend to rely on these cues, right? They're in these prediction markets, right, that happen. People are very good at, at sort of saying what will replicate or not, right? Um, but they're just, it just doesn't seem to be applied, right, when they're also doing their own work, right? But extending it to the lay people, that would be, I think, extremely relevant and, and extremely interesting. Of course, there's always a danger there. There's all this work that shows that people tend to fall for more flashy findings, right? So people tend to think that if papers have math in them, right, or if they use techniques like fMRI, then they think that they're simply more true, right? Or 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 they're more, uh, you know, more, I don't know, like just, just fancier, right? And then more accurate, right? But yeah, it's it might be something that to to, to look into actually. And, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, I think we have a question from uh, YJ uh, saying thank you. Very interesting research. Uh, wondering uh, whether people with more biased beliefs rather than confident uh, in their correctness would also respond fast. So I think this speaks to. Uh, this uh, inherent perhaps contradiction that on one side, a very quick gut reaction could be very, very biased. But on the other side, it seems like here it's associated yeah. with uh, accuracy. So maybe you can yeah. speak to that uh, contradiction and how that applies in the algorithms. No, so this is a, an excellent question, right? And something that we also need to grapple with in, in the eventual uh, discussion of, of the paper. Well, one thing that you could say is that well, you guys are only focusing on um, judgments and, and areas in judgments where faster responses are simply correlated with more accuracy, right? So for a general knowledge question, uh, a sort of a naive theory could be that 
if I know the answer, right, I'm just going to immediately know it, right? And then uh, it's it's going to be there, right? Uh, for medical diagnoses, right, if the, the doctor recognizes certain patterns in the patient history, right, or, or whatever, they're just going to be like, oh, okay, yes, it's, uh, it, it's hypertension, we're moving along, right? Um, for other types of judgments, which we simply don't know, right, we want to sort of demonstrate this, uh, our, our initial goal here um, is, first of all, to demonstrate the effectiveness, but also to demonstrate the effectiveness of response time as a cue, right? But we're also very careful, I think, in saying that fast shouldn't be always relied upon, right? And then this is a more, uh, I think this is where we're going for, at least uh, at least me and Philippe are very interested in this, is, is trying to say, when should you follow fast and when should you follow slow, right? So I fully agree that there can be uh, judgments and there can be judgmental areas where faster responses would be associated with more bias, right? Um, I'm trying to think of something just off the, off the top of my uh, head, right? But we see, for example, in these math questions, right? that faster responses don't seem to gain, don't seem to give you any sort of leverage, right? Don't seem to give you any additional accuracy, right? Compared to some of these other ones. So there, for example, providing more time, right? Or, or, or weighing more, uh, giving people sort of, um, not just more time, right? But weighing the answers of slower individuals more than faster ones could could be a better approach, right? So there's definitely a confluence between like a, a congruency between the situation and and response time selection algorithm for sure, right? Uh, but I mean, we just we just have to look at a bit more into. We have some other data as well, which I said, uh, which I'm which I'm not sort of going to talk about because we're not that sort of confident that that it's still there. We need to run a couple. Of, this is also related to. I need to send it to a bunch of people to check the code, right? But we also look into forecasting, right? Um, and, and and a bunch of other uh, stuff, right? Like multiple choice questions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we do see patterns there, right? But I, I don't want to sort of uh, give away the thing because it can it could still easily come the other way around, right? So, so I think you, you mentioned like with the CRT. CRT is a good example for where yeah. people's gut reactions they respond very fast, and then if you give them a second or like a minute, yeah. What what did you answer? Are they like, of course I made a mistake. Let me just correct this uh, now. Yeah. So this is this is like CRT is at the uh, the heart yeah. of this uh, contradiction. It's a perfect example, right? The CRT is right. literally a question that is made to trip up fast responses, right? So yes. uh, that's sort of that's sort of the the inherent problem that that we have here in, in arguing for this is that we need to sort of identify, I guess, um, which I think is something that a lot of social psychologists are, are, aren't interested in it, with this sort of interpretation of like, how does the situation affect this, right? We used to be uh, very interested in this, right? But now it's, you know, all of this other work was sort of like, you know, you put, you're put in a different roles, your situation changes, et cetera, et cetera, right? But I think there's a, yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff that can be done here, right? And, and how it relates to response time, right? For sure, for sure. Right. Do you think there's a, like, if we try and understand, so what, what is it? that creates this uh, faster being being more accurate uh, is it intelligence is there like more experience yeah. there like what is what what are your gut intuitions telling you yeah <laughs> i don't think i don't think it's related to any sort of uh you know crystallized uh, uh traits right like uh or more stable traits like intelligence right it could be related to, to accessibility, right? Which which then is related to experience, right? So for in, in the example of the doctors, right? If they're more familiar, right? Uh, or, or simply they've seen some sort of patterns in, in, in these patient histories, right? It's more accessible, right? Therefore faster, and then, it's, uh, uh, and then it comes to your mind, right? And you're sort of more accurate about it, right? But then again, there's the converse of that, right? Which is that, uh, there might be situations, right, like we see uh, in, in maybe the fake news stuff, right, where um, familiarity, right, is also a, a form of accessibility, right? And when you say like, oh, this seems really familiar, right, I'm, I'm going to say that it's true, right? So there's there's ways in which that can sort of backfire um, as well, right? So cognitively, I don't I don't know, right? We're trying to look into a lot of interesting research that's related to like drift diffusion models, right? And, and these things that where they try to sort of disentangle, right? Um, um, the the uh, How response time is related to some of these judgments, right? There's a lot of work on this in heuristics and representativeness and all that stuff, right? But for now, it's it's more of a, it's more of a basic demonstration of, of what we have here, right? Okay, great. Uh, I don't see any other questions. So I'll make this like the last, the last one. Uh, let's say for, 
I get I get the students uh, asking me many times. It's like uh, I rely on my PI. I need money. I don't can do can not, can do nothing on my own. And here you suggest something remarkable. Like we've got all these TV shows, right? They're out there. They're on the broadcast uh, uh, website. Uh, you can go and you can code this. You can also reach out to other people who have published and collaborate with them, asking to recode uh, their stuff. Uh, perhaps you will need to watch all the TV shows. Perhaps there's like a different way. I don't know. Chat GPT can maybe not the, the, when they start writing their answers, but maybe we can do some cool stuff. So can you just like maybe from your experience, give some tips to somebody who does not have their own resources to collect data and all this, what's out there, like how to best make uh, use of that? Uh, yeah. Just your perspective on uh, what, what can aid students or people uh, struggling with this that would like to do cool stuff like this. Yeah, no, I, I think this is um, extremely interesting. Also something that I personally didn't think about, right? So one is um, just simply, so for example, if you're interested in general decision-making, right, then uh, a, a very simple thing to do is, is try to find, um, air, you know, like examples or whether it's game shows or, or just other types of data collected where decisions are being made in a different context, right? So there's a lot of work, well, a lot is a very, it's an overestimation, not a lot, right? But people have looked into these these quizzes, for instance, right, to show uh, that people have a gender bias when they're, you know, uh, uh, donating things, right? Or, or, you know, there's a lot of these quizzes that also employ things that we're interested in, like prisoners' dilemmas, right? Social dilemmas, et cetera, et cetera, that are easily sort of, well, I don't know whether they're easily available, right? but they're sort of certainly more available and, and, and freer, right? And in terms of funds, than collecting this data in a more artificial process, right? The other thing that I would advise everyone to do, and, and what, I'm, what I'm also doing now is, is using uh, uh, ways to find interesting data sets, right? So uh, there's like Google Scholar, there's also Google data sets, right? So you can find data sets that are sort of publicly available. Uh, there's publicly available surveys, there's publicly available uh, uh, sort of large scale government data collections, right? Where for instance, they just might ask people to make predictions, right? For, for, for something, right? And you can easily uh, uh, try to look into, into some of these areas uh, and, and, and try to find them there. There's also um, organizations uh, that try to collect a bunch of this data, right? But often don't know, or maybe they're not immediately thinking of research to do with it, right? So there's apps, like uh, there's an app uh, um, that where if you're a doctor, for instance, you can like Duolingo, you can practice your diagnostic skills, right? So what we also try to do is try to get access to some of that uh, uh, data and information as well, right? Or um, there's a bunch of these things where I think it's, 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 it's not easily available. You have to have the idea, right? But it's certainly much more available now, right, than, than I think, uh, well, you know, several years ago, right? And it's certainly a possibility to do something with it rather than just, you know, the classic enter prolific crowdsourced data collection, right, uh, that requires uh, some funding, right? So I would encourage everybody to try to do it, right? And, and also try to get involved in these more large scale projects, right, that, that, that benefit from volunteers, right? You can certainly learn a lot because these people are very good at like managing you, right? So your tasks are pretty clear. Um, and you also get to learn a lot, right? And you also most often get to benefit, right? Whether it's a publication or um, just being able to sort of um, work with some of these people, right? It's, it's, it's excellent, right, I think. Terrific. I've, I've learned a lot. Lots of food for thought. Uh, very glad for this, uh, for this opportunity for us to, uh, to meet online and uh, exchange some ideas and hear from you. So thank you very much for this. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, I'll make everything available on uh, YouTube and, uh, and OSF. I'll reach out to you to ask for the slides and everything else. Uh, thank you very much for your time.